Hi everyone, this week I want to talk about parsing and layout. Uh, there was a GHC bug posted recently asking essentially for better error messages around, um, around some, some layout trouble. And uh, after exploring it a bit, it, there's just sort of a, a, a wealth of weird things that can happen with layout. And I thought we'd explore some of them together today. And, um, and I, I, my, my goal here is to teach you the actual quite simple layout rule that GHC uses to manage its indentation. Um, so, so Haskell, as we know, is a, um, is, a, is a white space sensitive language. So that means that as we indent things, that actually has semantic meaning in our code, right? This is different than a lot of other languages. So in particular, something like Java, right? Everything is determined by our braces and our semicolons. We could mess up the indentation any way we like and, and, the, and our programs would have the same meaning. That is not true in Haskell. Um, so, so we use indentation to try to inform what a program means. So a really simple way to see this, if I type x equals 5 here, right, that's going to work. Um, and then if on the next line I indent and I type y equals 10, well, now we have a problem. Because essentially what's happening here is that, is that GHC thinks that this line here is a continuation of that line there. Um, so it, it, equal signs aren't allowed in general, right? So this y equals 10, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, becomes a, a parse error because we're not expecting um, an equal sign there. If I do something else, like let's say I say this, well, let's see what happens here. We're still going to get an error. Maybe I'll make a little bit more space down here. Um, so illegal type 10. Oh, well, haha, yes, of course it is. Um, let's say I do that. Um, now we get variable not in scope. Why? And it sort of looks like this should be a type signature. But again, the, the compiler sees this y as a continuation of that line there. Um, so how does this work? Well, in every layout sensitive context, uh, the, the GHC chooses a particular column in our file as the initial column, and then everything else that's in that same column is considered sort of a sibling node in, in, our, in, our, um, in our tree. So um, in other words, that they're considered sort of at the same level. So here, I could fix this problem by, by moving this out. Um, of course, y doesn't have a definition, so I'm going to change this back to equals uh, 10. Um, and this is fine. Or actually, I could move that in. Right? As long as they're the same, everything is going to work out fine. And so in particular, what's happening here is that when we declare a module, actually any, any construct that we start with where, that begins a layout context. So what, what GHC does is it's going to look for the next, uh, the next lexeme. A lexeme is something that's not white space and not a comment. Um, and then that sets the column number um, for this where clause, including a whole module size where. Um, so here, because I've gone in by one space, I've now said that everything in this module that I want to declare has to be one space indented. And I can keep doing this and everything's fine. But if I don't respect this, if I now write something out here, um, now we get an error. In fact, we get an error right here at the beginning of the line because in a, in, a, in, a, in a Haskell module, nothing can, ha can exist outside of that module. So as soon as I've outdented, I've already run into trouble. Um, okay, so that's, that's the basic rule. The basic rule is every time we start a layout block, um, and I'll put a little comment here to remind ourselves. So layout blocks are started with where, as we see here, of, as in case of, let, which, which causes some, some quite strange effects sometimes, and do. Um, and so these are the four keywords. There's a few other random things. So if you have if, the using multi-way if, and then the pipe, that starts a, um, a layout block. Lambda k starts a layout block. Uh, you know, one might argue that we should have kept this, this list fixed. So in standard Haskell, we're just going to stick with where of let and do, because these always introduce layout blocks. So it's a little bit more reliable. Um, it's also worth pointing out that the very beginning of a module also starts a layout block. So if I don't have a module header, this, this behaves the same way. Um, and so it will start looking for that first lexeme um, uh, and, and, and fixes the column number of the module with that lexeme. OK, uh, let's get rid of that error. We'll bring this back and start exploring some, some other um, aspects of this. So really what, what, what's happening here is that these layout blocks 
we can think of it as implicitly inserting braces and semicolons. And in fact, in the Haskell report, this is how layout is specified. Um, so many people don't realize this, but actually we don't need layout at all in Haskell. Instead, we could always use braces and semicolons. Um, so if the first lexeme after a layout block herald, that's this where of letter do, if a, the next lexeme is an open brace, then layout is turned off for that block. And instead, we have to use semicolons. So here's my Haskell module. And it's starting to look a little bit more like C or Java, but that's fine. Um, but it also means that I can do strange things about indentation, and that's all OK. Um, so actually, in the GHC source code itself, we tend to use a lot of braces and semicolons because sometimes we have longish functions, long functions with lots of nested do blocks. Um, and instead of slowly moving our way to the right, uh, that gets tiresome somewhat quickly. And so we use braces and semicolons to allow, allow ourselves some more flexibility. Um, so this is an alternative, right? If you really are uncomfortable with white space sensitive um, parsing, we can, you can always turn it off by using an open brace. Um, but we can also think of the, the layout algorithm as inserting braces and semicolons. Um, so here we have this module. Let's bring it back to the way it was. This should work. And so the rule is that we start here. So because this is in column two, we, st we start counting columns at, at one. So this is column one. This is column two. Um, so then we remember layout block at column two. And then every time we see something else at column two, we're going to insert a semicolon. So this y, this is a new line beginning at column two, so we're going to invisibly insert a semicolon. Uh, down here, z is another lexeme that happens at column two, so we're going to insert a semicolon. Now, does this still compile? It does, because actually, uh, Haskell allows semicolons to be mixed with layout. So technically, what would happen here is that we have a, an x equals 5. Then the first thing it sees is a semicolon. And so it actually adds another semicolon, an invisible one this time. Uh, but that doesn't cause any trouble either. Um, so we get an invisible semicolon and then another one, because we're sort of mixing layout and semicolons. But, but that's OK. Haskell is designed to allow this flexibility as well. So if we wanted to write a semicolon at the end of each line, we could. Of course, semicolons don't deactivate layout. So if we did all of this and then had abc equals blah here, um, what would happen? Well, actually, this would be OK. This would be OK because this is now after column 2. This is now column 3. We don't insert a semicolon here because it's one step in. Um, but there is already a semicolon in the code. So this is still correct. Oh, well, not, not when I make a, another silly error. It's not correct. But now it's correct. What won't work is if I move this ABC out to column 1. And then now, when we move out, when we, when we have a lexeme that occurs before the column um, of, a, of a certain layout block, it inserts an invisible close brace. And so this close brace here, let me bring in that open the matching open brace uh, because we can't have an implicit close brace match an explicit open brace that or I think I got that backwards. Anyway, the braces have to have the same implicitness. Um, so if we have this this close brace, now we have something outside the module and that's just not allowed. Um, and and so that's no good. So the, so here the parse error. Look at if we look at the error here, um, the parse error is actually the ABC. The close brace itself is okay. Um, OK, so let's get rid of these braces, get rid of that, get rid of this. OK, so where things get interesting is where we start nesting these beasts. Um, so uh, I'm actually, let's stop worrying about the outermost uh, layout block for a sec, uh, because normally we don't use braces and semicolons there. But instead, let's suppose we have x equals do, and then inside of a do block, I can have um, oh, that's bad Haskell, isn't it? I should use put Sterlin. Um, and um, we can have two lines here. Okay, so so this is a valid do block. What happens here, again, because do is a layout block herald, is it will look for the first lexeme, that's this put Sterlin, and that starts at column, I guess it looks like one, two, three. That starts at column three. So that marks this layout block 
at column three, and then this is at the same column, so everything is good. If I indent, now we get something quite strange here. Could not match expected type blah, 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 blah. Well, that's because there's no semicolon here. And so GHC sees it looking like this. So it's looking like I'm calling putsterlin with three arguments, which is, of course, not what I want to do. Um, and again, so here it's correct, adding one space and we get obscure uh, type error. If I go in the other direction, well, now we have a, a lexeme that occurs before the layout block uh, column number here. So we're out one level. So that's going to put an invisible close brace. And then um, unexpected do block in function application. Well, because that puts a close brace, the do looks like this. And then this looks like an argument to the result of the do. Um, which we don't allow, right? We don't allow a do block to be a function, uh, uh, to be a function. Although I'm actually, now that I see it, I'm a little surprised because it could theoretically have the right type. Um, I almost wonder if that's an, an extra rule somewhere. I'm not, I could look into that, but we're, let's not, let's not get stuck on that route. Um, and then if I move it out one more, now we have the outer level, the, the module level semicolon gets inserted here. And we're going to get something about, oh, this is a weird um, uh, uh, top level definition that we're not expecting. OK, so things get stranger still if I start nesting let in with do, because now we have two, uh, now we actually have three layout blocks all, all together. So I can say let x, or let's not use x again, that's just confusing. So if I say let y equals 5, well, that's fine. Obviously, we're not using y, so we get a, a, a small warning down there, but, but this still works. Um, let's turn off warnings so we stop getting those. Uh, what was this? Un, no unused local binds. OK. Um, um, OK, so now now we have some, some more nesting. So. Here, one question that one might wonder is, this semicolon, which block does it belong to? Is this separating out uh, do bits, or is this setting out let bits? Um, so if I write z equals 10 here, is that OK, or is that not OK? So it turns out that's OK, because the semicolon, if we think about an algorithm that implicitly inserts braces and, and semicolons, well, my let really opened up an invisible brace here. So this semicolon just fits nicely within that brace. Um, so what if I do this here? Well, now this, because I've, I'm outdented with respect to the Y, there's a close brace on my let block. Um, uh, and, and so this Z, again, sort of looks like it's in some kind of argument position for the let block, which just isn't allowed. Um, so that's that's no good. So we get we get um, we get an error there. Um, okay, so let's not do that. Um, but what can be confusing is that sometimes let's comment this stuff out. I've seen code that looks like this. So we can have let x equals five, print x. All right. And at first that looks kind of sensible. So we have a do. There's two components to the do. But if we remember the layout rule, this isn't going to work. Um, and, and the problem is, is that we insert an open brace here, and then we have a semicolon, and then that semicolon ends up belonging to the let, and then it, it's expecting this piece here to be the next part of the let, but of course it's not. So I'd have to do, I'd have to put an explicit close brace to my let, and then I could have a semicolon like that, and now it's okay. And this semicolon is optional, it's not, not hurting anything. Um, so that's one weird thing that can happen with these nested layout blocks. Uh, let me, let's look at one other interesting scenario, uh, unrelated. So we can also do things without do. So sometimes we might want to write this. So if I maybe have let x equals 5 in x plus x. So now how does this react with all of these other rules that I'm stating? So this is perfectly good, Haskell. And so I said that we insert an implicit open brace when we see the let, and we, we insert an explicit close brace when we have something that's outdented. So according to that rule, this makes perfect sense. 
right? This in is outdented with respect to my x, so we're going to get an implicit close brace, which closes off the list of let bound identifiers. Um, but then why does this work? Well, it turns out there's another little rule here, which is if there is an error, if there is a lexeme that is unexpected, close off the, the, the layout block. So this in, which is unexpected in this spot, it inserts an implicit close brace, and indeed we get this behavior, which is what we wanted. Okay, so there's one really bizarre case that came up, and this is the one that came up in the ticket, and we'll, we'll end with this last one. Um, and that is if we have something that looks like this. So we begin a do, and then inside the do, we have let x equals 5, and then lined up here, plus 10, and then maybe down here we have print x. And, it, and the error is the last statement in a do block must be an expression. Right? So this is, a, this is a rule saying that if you have a do block, the last thing must be an expression. We can't have a let be the last thing in a do block, um, because what would that do block return? It doesn't really make sense. But it's really hard to figure out why this is the particular error that we get. So to figure this out, let's add in the braces and the semicolons. So the first thing we get is this is the first lexeme after the do. So we're going to insert a brace there. So I'm just going to move that over so that the column numbers continue to line up. Then right here, this is the first lexeme after the let. So we're going to put in an open brace there. Now this plus is lined up with the, um, with the x here. So it looks like we should put in a semicolon. But then the plus itself is unexpected. This is an unexpected lexeme. So we don't get a semicolon. We get a close brace. But then actually, even for the do block, this is an unexpected lexeme. So we get another close brace. And that's how this is parsed. So the do just contains this let x equals 5, which is itself well formed, but then it becomes the last statement of a do block. Um, so this, this took some, some hunting to figure out. Um, not at all obvious. The good news is, is that by applying these rules carefully um, and then perhaps adding in braces, if you ever get yourself confused, you can find your way out of strange parsing scenarios. Um, so I, uh, the last thing I want to say is that there's actually a pretty decent explanation of this in the Haskell report. Um, so over here we have this, it does begin informally stated and then goes on to be quite formal. Um, and that's because there's an even more formal version somewhere else. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but you might find that interesting. Um, in any case, I will link to it from the description. I hope this has been interesting. Thanks for watching.